Father, we come before you and we do pray right now, just <clears throat> someone coming into your house. The Lord needs your touch. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We pray, Father, just for your hedge of protection around them. As we open your word, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts afresh. And as we see, Lord, again, the children of Israel standing before you, Lord, there is a day when all of us will stand before you, whether we know you or not. And none of us knows that day. And so I ask that you would open your word to every heart that's here, every heart that's listening. You would speak directly to them. So please settle our hearts, Lord. Bless this time in your word and let your Holy Spirit move. We pray through the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus chapter 20. And actually, <clears throat> just to put you back in context, because we've been at this for a few weeks. Boy, tell us. All right. Chapter 19. Verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And so chapter 20, we get into what he eventually would say to them. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Now, when you, when you go to the movies, if you go to the movies, you know, you see the previews, and they're always, you know, end of the world or other stuff they have. They have all these different genres that they're out there in action and whatever. And, and so you're used to like an IMAX theater and like, you know, and all the sounds and things blowing up and all that. But, I mean, the loudest thing these people have are barn animals. They've never seen special effects. Probably most never saw a volcano erupting. So to see a mountain that's engulfed in flames, by the way, still blackened from those flames, you can go to our website and look at the banner there and find the thing on Mount Mos on Mountain of Moses. But to see that and hear this, they don't have PA systems. To hear this loud trumpet getting louder and louder in this manifestation of the presence of God and earthquake and smoke and, and all that, I mean, please understand, they're, they're sitting there just going, whoa, and lightning and thunder, and they're out in the open and things are just flying around and... Then this voice comes to him. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, <clears throat> for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, which you now know means murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, or vice versa, thy neighbor's husband. His manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And so, how long did that take me to read? A couple minutes, right? Yes, yeah, six weeks, yeah. <laughs> well, 
feeling the love up here from Kenny, man. Like, wow, he's got a point. How long did it take for God to recite these things? Maybe I should say that more properly. Thank you for the correction. It's not a very long conversation. But the mountains burning with fire, the lightning and the thunder, you know, going back and forth, the trumpets blowing loudly, and they're just taking this all in. And so verse 18, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. You see, they're just kind of keep creeping backwards away as he's talking. They're just like, whoa, never seen anything like this. You tune in to some of the ministries and teaching and things that are out there, and you almost get the sense from listening to these people, they're like, yeah, I spent the weekend with Jesus. You know, I had one lawn chair, he had the other. We just kicked back, you know, just fellowshiped and, and all that. And you, you hear some people's description of, of a true encounter with God, and, and I listen going, hmm. Because when you look through the Scripture, you'll see that encounters with God are quite overwhelming. Really starting at the beginning, when Adam and Eve disobeyed, how many commandments? Well, it said that God came into the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve heard that the Lord had entered the garden and they hid themselves, for they were afraid. That fear, that dread of knowing now that something had happened, they disobeyed God, that awareness that they had transgressed or disobeyed or rebelled. And so they hear the voice of the Lord and they're hiding. And you know what the Lord said? He said, Adam, where are you? Now listen, it's not that he doesn't know. All right, for those who are, he's omniscient. He knows the end from the beginning. But he's giving an opportunity to confess. Where are you? Then he takes it another notch forward. Have you eaten of the tree? Well, you know, I hid in the garden. I was afraid I heard your voice for I, was, I knew I was naked. Who told you you were naked? That sense of a change now in their relationship. And then the open door for confession. Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? There was that sense of dread. You look at Abraham. Abraham, it tells us, believe God. He was coming back from the slaughter of the kings who had attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and stolen his nephew Lot. He went and pursued them all the way up towards the area of Dan. That's really far north. And on the way back as he goes past the area that would become Jerusalem, he meets this priest, Melchizedek, this priest of righteousness, priest of peace, or Salem, gives him a, a share of the spoil, refuses to take anything from those ungodly kings he just delivered. And that chapter ends, chapter 15, the Lord says to Abram, fear not, Abram, I'm your exceeding great reward, your reward and your shield. And he said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? I've got this Eliezer servant in my house, and it looks like he's going to inherit. And the Lord brought Abraham out, and he said, look at the stars. Number them if you're able. So shall your seed be. And Abraham believed God, and you know, it was counted to him for righteousness. And he believed God with a lot less record than you have. Because it's always been by faith. And he said, well, how shall I know? And so God directed Abraham to cut karath, to cut a covenant. Take these animals, cut them in two, separate them. And the idea when you would cut a covenant is the people making the agreement would sacrifice and divide the animals, and they would walk through the parts together. And that is, if I fail to keep this covenant, let me become like that. So Abraham prepared these things, was chasing away the birds of prey from them that day, and eventually as it headed down into sundown, it tells us that a great great basically darkness of fear in a sense a dread came upon him to where he was eventually immobilized and as it became evening into darkness he saw a smoking furnace manifest and walk between these two parts and so God was making this covenant with Abraham but it was a unilateral covenant dependent only upon God but that presence of God before him was such that he again was overwhelmed this sense of like oh my goodness Isaiah in chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, he was brought into the presence of God. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He had in five chapters been telling the Israelites, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, because they had really strayed away from God. He gets pulled up into the presence of God and he says, woe to me. 
And he cried out. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And one of the seraphim took the live coal there from that altar before God and touched his lips. And he said, this is purged, your lips. That sense of when you're in God's presence of, oh my goodness. Daniel the prophet. Greatly loved, we're told gets brought into Nebuchadnezzar's dream that God is going to send a rock cut without human hands who will rule and reign forever. God is going to bring an individual through which he will establish a kingdom that has no end. He seeks God for this, and God shows him in chapter 7, this one like a son of man who will come to the Ancient of Days who will rule and reign. Chapter 9, he lets him know he'll be cut off. Chapter 10, he's fasting, he's afflicting himself, he wants to know more. And he's by the river Hittichel, and then suddenly there's this manifestation of the presence of God and he sees one whose eyes are like a flame of fire, white garment, gold sash around his chest, feet like bronze, and the voice that sounds like the voice or sound of many waters. And when he sees this, he loses all strength and collapses in front of this individual. An angel comes and touches him, begins to speak to him, strengthens him. And as he starts talking then to Daniel of what's coming, Daniel again, like a wilting flower, just goes down to where his face is on the ground. And he basically says, I can't breathe. That's what happens when people have a real experience in the presence of God. Which could be a bit overwhelming, don't you think? So here they are watching these things, blown away. Think about it, even John. Who's John? The apostle. How long was he with Jesus? Three and a half years. Yet when he writes in Revelation chapter 1, I heard one behind me saying, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And behold, again, one with a white garment, girt about the chest with gold, feet like burnished bronze, eyes a flame of fire, his voice the sound of many waters. And John, who knew him so well down on earth, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. How do you approach a God like that? So all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they were moved and they stood afar off. <laughs> you probably, I would too. And they said unto Moses, how about you speak with us? And we will hear, did they? Well, you'll see as we work through. But let not God speak with us lest we die. Moses, in dealing with the children of Israel, finally in chapter 34 of Exodus, we'll get there. Finally, he's just, it's been a, a real run for his money. And he says to the Lord, show me your glory. I just, I, I need to, you know, I need to know why I'm doing this, basically. Show me your glory. And God said to Moses, you cannot see my face and live. Okay. You're already waiting for me in Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9, just before the Psalms. How many of you have read the book of Job? All right, a few reluctant hands, a few high hands, good. How many of you are afraid to read the book of Job lest you become Job? <laughs> There's a few hands. First service, like, guilty. So let me give you the book in one simple sentence. God is allowing Job to go through a trial that will defeat, basically, Satan in his attempt to get Job to blaspheme the Lord. But in the process of schooling Satan on home turf advantage, he will use that trial and that affliction of Job to minister to, if it's as old as we think, 3,800 years worth of people seeking God in trouble. If you told Job, look, you're going to go through it for whatever it is, months or whatever the case may be, but out of that, I'm going to restore you. You're going to pass the test and untold millions are going to find comfort in your seeking God in a time of great difficulty. I think Job would have been humbled to say, you let me do that for you? You see, trials are how you see them. But Job, in the midst of this, he said, verse 29, If I be wicked, then why labor then I in vain? Verse 30, chapter 9, If I wash myself with snow water, can't get any more pure than that, 
Make my hands never so clean. Yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and my own clothes shall abhor me. For God is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Can't just meet him in court. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. In other words, there's no one to be between me and God who can lay hand on God and lay a hand on me and reconcile us and pull us back together that I might be able to plead my cause with God and for God to be able to explain to me what it is I've done. He was crying out for a redeemer. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Verse 34, but let him take his rod away from me. Let not his fear terrify me. For then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. If only I could plead my case and be heard before God. This cry. From the beginning, in fact, from the moments after that first act of disobeying one commandment, Adam and Eve, God began to tell us through his scripture that he was going to make a way. You know what happened. You got to Adam, you know, have you eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Adam, mightiest man we could possibly know, said, it's the woman. What a guy. But eventually when he got to Eve and to the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between the serpent, Satan, and his minions and the seed of the woman. You're going to bruise his heel, the seed that will come from the woman, but in bruising his heel, he's going to crush your head break your power. So right from the beginning, this promise that there would be one to come and to deliver. Jacob on his deathbed, if you remember in Genesis 49, he said, the scepter will not depart from Judah, ruling, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, the one who makes peace, shall come. Again, this anticipation. There's one coming who's going to again set things right, coming from Jacob. We also had Abraham again. Through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So this amazing promise, here we have them saying, look, how about you talk to us? We don't want to hear God. We're overwhelmed. We can't handle it. So back to chapter 20, verse 19. They said to Moses, speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Now, he will commend them for this answer. So here's our question. How will we know when it's him? How will we know when the one that God intended to send to pay for our sins, to wash us clean so that we could be in his presence will have come? That is essentially the testimony of the Bible. The majority of it is to prophecy, talking about this coming redeemer. He would do it through the nation of Israel which is why they've been so horribly persecuted, because the kingdom of darkness is aware. He would do it in the fullness of time. You've got to have a common language, Greek, Roman roads, so it can get around. God knew exactly what he was doing for timetable. He even told us with such specificity that what he would do, turn to Isaiah 52, that I have heard that there are anti-missionaries among the Jews, and when someone gets evangelized or they start asking questions about Isaiah 53, they'll say, well, you can't read that without a rabbi to sit with you and explain it. And I might add, explain it away. But go to Isaiah chapter 52. This coming one who could lay his hand on God and lay his hand on us and redeem us back to, ourself, back to himself Chapter 52, verse 13, the Lord said, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. <clears throat> as many as were astonished at you, so his visage or his appearance or his countenance was so marred, so beaten more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And so shall he sprinkle many nations with what? With his blood. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. Herod did run out of questions. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Isaiah cries out almost incredulously as he reveals these things because he knows it's going to be ignored. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm or the strength of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, 
And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Yet surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Remember the high priest when Jesus said, I'll be at the right hand of the Father? He ripped his clothes and said, he's spoken blasphemy. For those who didn't believe, they thought he was getting punished as a blasphemer. Stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, everyone. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's bought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb or silent. So he opened not his mouth, he made no defense. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off, the idea executed, out of the land of the living. Why? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked. He died between two thieves. And with the rich in his death, whose tomb did he borrow? Joseph of Arimathea. But because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. I have to explain to you, sin offerings die. You know that, right? He shall see his seed or his followers. Wait a minute. How can he die and see those who follow him? And look what it says again. He shall prolong his days. What is this? Resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge, some argue you could also translate it, by the knowledge of him. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. So here we have the children of Israel at this mountain, burning with smoke and fire. And you have to remember something. Having come out of Egypt, some of them probably got caught up in the Egyptian idolatry. Some of them, the Egyptians had some interesting things they would partake of, got caught up in those things for sure. You can bet they coveted. Why didn't I get their jewels from the neighbor? Why did you get them? When they stand before God and they hear the Ten Commandments, it's not like these people were, you know, pure and pristine. They're listening going, busted, busted, busted. And they just start getting further and further away. So busted, so, so busted. And what the law shows you is you can't save yourself. Which means there's got to be another way. The law was used to keep the Jews separate from the people around them, even to the present. It was used to protect them and preserve them so that from Abraham, from the tribe of Jacob, from the line of David, God could bring the son of David, the Messiah. After that death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, you know your history, 70 AD, the temple was destroyed and the records proving those genealogies were destroyed with them. It's almost as though they aren't needed anymore. So how can we approach a God who is so holy that if we see him, we'll be destroyed and consumed? And for those who interact with him at some level on his choosing, they're overwhelmed and feel like they're dying. This is why, for example, the apostles standing before the Sanhedrin said, there is, not, there is salvation in no other name but Jesus of Nazareth. This is why Paul writing to Timothy said, look, God desires all men to be saved. There's one mediator between man and God. It's the man Christ Jesus. There's only one that fulfills 300 plus prophecies who satisfies the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And to anyone who receives them by faith, he'll give to them forgiveness of sin, a clean slate with God, and fill their heart with his Holy Spirit. So as we're watching this mountain of Sinai and this giving of the Ten Commandments and the coming of the law of God, what the law's job is to do is take you by the hand and put you at the feet of Jesus. You can't do this on your own. You have to trust in him. 
So this is all going down, and we have the benefit of the rest of the book, but these people are sitting there just blown away like, okay then. So they said to Moses, verse 19, you speak with us. Speak thou with us and we will hear. Do they? Keep coming back. But let not God speak with us lest we die. This idea was commended by God. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Just before they enter into the promised land, Moses gives them a second giving of the law because the generation that wouldn't go in has passed and the generation that is going in needs to be educated. And in Deuteronomy 18, here the Lord speaking through Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken, or listen, according to all that thou desired of the Lord thy God in our chapter, chapter 20, in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord sped, said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. So I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. How many times did you hear Jesus say, my words are not my own, but the Father who sent me. I do always those things that please him. I say only those things that he has shown me. Over and over, Jesus made it clear he was only speaking the words of the Father who sent him. He is that prophet. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So, back to the mountain burning with fire. Moses, tell you what, you speak with us, we'll hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Verse 20, <clears throat> and Moses said unto the people, fear not, that's yare, that's to be dread or fear, fear not, for God has come to prove you that you may fear or that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. Notice that verse, the simple connection. You have a healthy fear of God, it's going to keep you from getting caught up in sin. You have a healthy fear of God, you're not caught up in erotic literature. You have a healthy fear of God, you're not caught up in pornography. You have a healthy fear of God, you're not caught up in affairs. You have a healthy fear of God, you're not caught up in heroin or fentanyl or other sub alcohol, whatever. You have a healthy fear of God, you're not an absolute outrageous jerk at home or jerk at. It can go both ways. If you have a fear of God, it changes how you live. Outbursts of wrath, contentions, jealousies, selfish ambitions, Factionalism, all these things, works of the flesh, all when you lose your fear of God. We were talking about on Wednesday night, we go through couples, Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Then we get to what a wife should do. Then we get to what a husband should do. A man who fears God is a man who's walking in the spirit. A man who loses his fear of God walks in his flesh. It's a very hard man to be married to and to love. A woman who walks in the fear of God is walking in the spirit. A woman who loses her fear of God, with whatever the case may be, is a very difficult woman to love because she's walking in the flesh. Our country has lost its fear of God. And look what's happened in our cities and elsewhere. And honestly, when we see such a loss of fear of God, we find the evidence is the world becomes filled with violence, and it appears the thought of man is nothing but evil continually. Does that sound at all familiar? As we sit in a generation where you can go onto social platforms and see all kinds of violence, and that's just the content they allowed to go through, you're thinking, you're kidding. Oh, no. We've lost our fear of God. It starts slowly, but you get further and further away from it. And you say, well, nothing's happened. What's the next word? Yet. Yet. Because God will give you time to get it straightened out. The letters to the seven churches appear to be to seven real churches at the time that John wrote Revelation. However, there's also an interesting overlay that these seven churches seem to really do fit with the age of the church for the last 2,000 years and these different periods of time where the spirit was moving or grieved. 
But that final church, the church of Laodicea, if you're familiar with it, Jesus had to say to that church, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man will open to me, I will come in and sup with him. It's the church where Jesus has been pushed to the outside. And they say to themselves, we are rich in increase of goods and in need of nothing. Think of some of the messages preached out there now. And yet Jesus' evaluation was, you know not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, naked, and blind. I counsel you to buy gold refined in the fire, real godly works of the Spirit. You are in a generation that has seen Israel come back to the land. Some of you are old enough, you were around before they were a nation. That's a fulfillment of a prophecy made in Ezekiel 36, 37, as well as Isaiah 66, that they would be born in a day. And it happened May 14th, 1948, 4.30 p.m. Boom, Isaiah 66 fulfilled. Russia, a major player that's going to bring in what appears to be the beginning of the last days. On the move, technology in your pocket or in your hand right now with your verses that allow you to buy and sell that you could be cut off or canceled. And all around you, people are dying in their sins. And you may be the only Bible they read. And if you've lost your fear of God, you're probably not a very accurate representation of the love of God for them, but also the judgment of God that will be coming. That mountain sitting there watching this, you'd like to say, well, that was it. They straightened up and they ran beautifully after that. Well, come back. Don't lose your fear of God and don't lose your love of God because you'll go in all kinds of directions you shouldn't go. Fear not, the Lord God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces because if you have a healthy fear of God, the result, verse 20, is you sin not. How could I do this to God? The people stood afar off. You see him just keep shrinking back out into the wilderness there. The people stood afar off and Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Pretty obvious, yes? Okay, what did Paul tell us? The Jews require a sign. So they're here having this major event with God. And if you again go to the banner page of our website, you can see the high def footage of this mountain still burnt with fire. He left the sign behind as a witness. You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. How long is that going to take? Twelve chapters. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen, in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. God wants a simple, plain altar of earth. And, verse 25, if thou will make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, you, thou hast or you have polluted it, made it common or profane. Why? What makes it common? We don't know. That's why we come here. You answered. Okay, fine. When I take a hammer and I chisel that rock, I am now adding to that altar a work of man. How many are getting it? Like, whoa, whoa. What does the scripture say? For by grace through faith you have been saved. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, God's been consistent throughout his testimony. You can't stand on works. Moses, take your shoes off your feet. You can't add works to a sacrifice. You see, none of you would do this, but maybe first or third service. <sighs> I'm not going to have a good day today because I didn't get time to read my Bible, so now I don't know if God's going to go with me. And I mean, oh man, I, it's going to be a bad day. What are you adding? A work. Well, I, you know... I, I don't know if sure if I'm worshiping on the right day. Is it Sunday or is it Saturday? I better work on Saturday so I know I'm really good with God. What are you adding? A work. Salvation's a gift. And you decide whether or not you receive it. You're the one who judges for yourself. 
whether or not you're going to have your case dismissed when you stand before the judge of all the earth. You're in a one-to-one -one relationship with God right now. And if you're in the room and you're not a believer, you're here because he brought you here. No, he didn't. I drove it. No, he brought you here. Whether you know it or not. And the only way you can approach a God who can set mountains on fire, say, let there be light, and raise the dead, is to come to him by faith, just like everybody else did, both Old and New Testament. And you're the one who decides whether or not you accept him. Abraham believed God with 12 pages in, 12 chapters. You can literally turn on the tube, look at your smartphone, use a chip in your phone to buy stuff, and all the things you're doing are confirming the signs of the last days. And you're not sure whether or not he's real. If you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you lift up your tool upon it, you've polluted it, you've defiled it, made it common. Neither shall thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now he's going to give them some garments to take care of this. They're going to get themselves some boxers, basically, to deal with this problem. But look at chapter 21. Now these are the judgments, but thou shalt set before them. And if you buy a Hebrew servant, whoa, wait a second. We have 613 commandments throughout the whole five books of Moses. We just got through 10. True? Should we do them again? No, no, please keep going. <laughs> what is the next thing he wants to talk about? Slavery. So what's God's heart? Ten commandments. Here's how you deal with each other and live as people. First thing I want to deal with, slavery. If you don't understand, give it the week to think about it. First thing on his mind after setting the ground rules. We're out of time. We'll stand, we'll pray, and we'll come back next week, God willing. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. And how I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you. This is really between them and you. But I believe your Holy Spirit can so speak to them right now. There's only one thing they can do. Like Abraham, look up and believe. Exercise their will to put their faith in you alone. Thank you, Lord, if we'll confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth, believe in our heart that he rose from the dead, we'll be saved. Thank you, Lord, as we come before you and ask your forgiveness, you give to us eternal life. And thank you for that simple, observe, object, a simple lesson you gave us. The Pharisee who wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven but just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He left the house of God justified. Whether here or listening later, Lord, I pray that today would be the day they finally ask your forgiveness and they would experience the indwelling presence of God and that overwhelming love. Thank you, Lord, for all these things and go with us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.